Recording in progress. Hi, Assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, joining us today. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. So right now it's 10.03 a.m. So we'll be start our webinar around 10.05. So we'll be start around another two minutes. Thank you. Hello, Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. It's already 10.05 a.m. So we'll start our webinar for today. <clears throat> so Assalamualaikum and good morning. So, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Shahira Binti Abdurrahim from MIDF Research and I will be moderating today's webinar. 
So before we get started, I'm going to go through some housekeeping to ensure uh, you can interact with myself and the speakers. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box and in your question box in your Zoom control panel and I'll bring them up during the Q&A session. So now without further ado, let's uh, get straight to our discussion today. But before that, let me get, give you a little bit of context related to today's webinar. So the title of our webinar today is ESG and Palm Oil Industry between, between Myth and Reality. So today we'll be discussing about ESG related issue in our local plantation sector. Uh, as we all know, there, there has been so much negative sentiment over the palm oil industry and our local palm oil producers have had to deal with heavy criticism and mis misconceptions with regard, to the, with regard to the effect of production on ESG related issue. And if we look at the L Plantation Index, we can see that there has been a disparity between CPO prices and local plantation counters, which is possibly affected by the ESG criteria resulting in lower interest for plantation sector. So uh, on top of that, uh, planter sh share prices remain muted despite really in CPO prices. Hence, the purpose of today's webinar is to understand and assess the action the industry has done in the space of ESG and hopefully dispel some of the myths surrounding the palm oil, palm oil industry. So before we go further, let me introduce to all of you uh, our panel for today. Uh, I would like now to our I would like to welcome our speakers for today, uh, Dr. Ruslan Abdullah, the Director of Science, Environment and Sustainability Division from Malaysian Palm Oil Council, MPOC, and uh, Puan Nur Hassana, uh, Head of Group Sustainability Division from FGB Holdings, Perhat. Welcome. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are so glad you could be here today to share your insights on ESG-related issue uh, in the plantation industry. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome our first presenter, Fadur Hassana, to talk about FGV's ESG development and action that has that have been taken by FGV as one of their plantation players in Malaysia. Uh, over to you, Fadur Hassana. Right. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Shahira. And uh, let me uh, start with uh, thanking M MIDF for inviting me um, uh, to, to speak on uh, you know, FGV's uh, ESG initiative um, in the palm oil industry. So as uh, what Shahira alluded to, you know, palm oil <laughs> industry is heavily scrutinized um, in uh, respect of the ESG performance. Um, let me start by saying that, you know, palm oil is uh, an incredibly efficient oil, you know, uh, efficient crop and producing more oil. Uh, per land area than other equivalent uh, vegetable oil crop. And uh, globally, uh, uh, I believe all of us here know that palm oil supplies 40% of the world uh, veg oil demand um, on this under 6% of land use um, to produce all veg oil. So, which means we require lesser land area, uh, but we produce more veg oil compared to other uh, veg uh, products or crops. Um, so, I would say that, uh, you know, um, alternative crop uh, like soybean, coconut, sunflower oil would require between four to 10 times the larger space or land area to produce the equivalent um, of uh, what palm uh, produced and, and and the market value for palm oil is estimated at 42 um, billion in a year for 2020 and it is projected to increase um, you know at 57 billion by 2026 this is based on established established research and in the context of Malaysia uh, the government had you know um, ventured into palm oil as part of the nation pro program to eradicate poverty. And uh, as we, are all, we, we all know that, you know, uh, under SDG goal, the first goal is eradication of poverty. So that, that is, uh, you know, um, for Malaysia, this has been a method, a approach that we used uh, to support uh, the economic livelihood of our people since early 1980s. <clears throat> 
And uh, globally, millions of smallholders uh, farmer depend on producing palm oil for their livelihood. It's not only in Malaysia, but we, are, we, we can say that this is also true in other parts of um, the world uh, where palm oil is also produced. <laughs> Um, uh, and and I would also just to highlight the latest uh, World Bank uh, World Benchmarking Alliance report um, on you know uh, uh, that has that has listed FGV and Sangdabi uh, as among top 2,000 2, global companies and top 350 global food and agriculture companies which are critical in achieving SDGs. Um, so this is how important you know um, companies um, you know, in uh, farm industry company in supporting, um, you know, food food security for the for the world. But at the same time, uh, in doing so, we need to ensure that our operations um, in compliance with the requirement of ESG. So let me now dwell down um, into the uh, initiative or efforts that FGV has done. Um, the first thing um, with regard to sustainability. Um, what we need to establish is a good uh, sustainability governance and framework. So in FGV, you know, we have recently established the board sustainability committee. We believe that, you know, to drive sustainability agenda, it is, it is uh, the, the leadership support is very much needed. So with, um, with the board sustainability committee established focusing on FGV's initiative and efforts in enhancing um, uh, our sustainability agenda from environment, social and human rights aspect, it would give greater emphasis uh, on the implementation of these all efforts. And, and at, at, uh, at the management level, we also have you know, uh, the Sustainability Synergy Committee that uh, ensure the implementation of all the directives um, uh, and uh, you know, approve a decision by the board. Um, in terms of framework, um, in FGV, we have um, uh, adopted the sustainability policy, group sustainability policy. Uh, in, uh, and, and it has been uh, uh, revised many times to strengthen uh, the important component uh, with regard to sustainability. So the, uh, the group sustainability policy is grounded on uh, many uh, uh, international instruments uh, and also is grounded on the NDPE commitment, no deforestation, no peatland or and no exploitation commitment. And we also um, used uh, the many other international instruments, including the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, ILO Conventions, um, as well as uh, the environmental um, protocols as a basis to develop uh, the group sustainability policy. It is available on our web. Uh, I would invite all participants uh, to take a look at that. Uh, we spell out um, in, in detail as to what uh, uh, FGV committed. <coughs> um, and uh, in uh, what we have done in terms of implementation of uh, our commitment, and increasingly what we're seeing also internationally when you talk about sustainability, when they assess the sustainability performance of any company, um, uh, uh, emerging two main issues uh, can be seen. Uh, one is with regard to how we support initiative around climate action. The second is how we work on addressing uh, or mitigating or eliminating human rights risks in our operation. Yeah, so um, on climate action, um, with uh, the commitment of uh, Malaysia to Paris Agreement, and I, I believe everyone is aware, to just two days ago in uh, RMK 12, you know, the Prime Minister announced that Malaysia is committed to um, net zero ambition by 2050. Uh, based uh, using 2016 uh, baseline as uh, you know uh, the guide to achieve net zero by 2050. So uh, in line with this uh, international development, in line with this uh, national aspiration, FGV has also um, you know uh, committed to net zero ambition, and uh, in addition to that, we are also committed to science-based target which means you know, uh, we are going to develop our 
uh, GHG tar reduction target uh, together with science-based initiative uh, in accordance with uh, processes uh, that is recognized and adopted uh, by science-based uh, target initiative. So that, that, that is uh, uh, what uh, FGV has with regard to uh, you know, supporting the climate action. So in ensuring that it is just not a motherhood policy without any implementation plan, because we know that, you know, many criticism against company is that, you know, you, you can make motherhood statement, but how are you going to achieve that? What is your plan? Uh, so for FGB, we have outlined um, uh, uh, an integrated climate action plan based on six main trusts. Uh, that is based on climate governance and risk management. Uh, I think we are, we are familiar with TCFD uh, framework um, and uh, we have embedded that in part uh, as part of our you know, uh, governance, sustainability climate governance uh, for FGV. And we have a second plan with regard to carbon management. This is where we, are, we um, have been working on uh, developing our GHG inventory um, and coming up with GHG management plan. Uh, and our baseline would be 2019, uh, <coughs> GHG uh, in emission. And uh, we are also looking at mapping uh, HFC usage in FGV. Uh, uh, and uh, to see how uh, we can introduce alternative to HFC ammonia. Um, and we have uh, started since 2019, but uh, I believe now it's time to rigorously intensify that, uh, you know, uh, initiative in uh, ensuring or implementing alternative to HFC. And uh, uh, we also uh, have um, embarked in renewable energy initiative, and I, this is not something new for FGV. Um, uh, as you are aware, FGV, uh, when you, um, you know, uh, involve in, in that palm industry, you have uh, mills, uh, we have mills, um, which uh, emits palm oil, there is affluent, uh, palm oil affluent and all that. So we have uh, installed 28 biogas facilities in our um, uh, mill operation. We have a total of 67 mills. 28 is equipped with biogas facilities and we are looking at, uh, we have planned to expand uh, and to ensure that all 67 mills um, are uh, environment friendly, uh, will be able to support our climate action with uh, the installation of biogas facilities. Um, so, uh, and on, on top of um, uh, the cover management, we are also looking at waste management, circular economy, uh, uh, we are doing waste mapping uh, in our uh, effort to adopt zero waste policy. Um, and, I, and as I said, uh, in, in palm oil industry, you know, there's a lot of uh, waste component uh, from EFB bunches and all that. So we are working on mapping and looking at how this uh, uh, circular economy can be fully implemented um, in, in our operation. Uh, and um, we have also embark on water management uh, initiative to ensure that we can support our climate action. And uh, in doing all that, you know, we realize that it's also important to create awareness among our people and also among, with, among the public on uh, the, uh, what is climate action all about. So we have uh, internal, uh, for our internal board members, we have trainings, we have, you know, dialogue on, on uh, uh, climate action, climate initiative, and we are also working with other stakeholders, uh, and uh, we are about to embark on very, very soon in the next couple of days, you know, with a, a government agency on uh, some um, uh, public awareness uh, campaign for climate action initiative. <coughs> so, um, and for MGV, we coined this climate awareness program as a smart for climate. So you will very soon see, you know, our collaboration with um, uh, upcoming collaboration with Ministry of Environment and Water um, or for national awareness program. Uh, this is, uh, we, are, we are going to have um, uh, a national essay competition uh, for students uh, for them to express their views, their knowledge, uh, uh, their opinion on how Malaysia is managing climate action. So that is on climate and we're seeing increasing, um, you know, attention, increasing uh, questions by our stakeholders 
to understand where we are with regard to our support um, to climate initiative. And the other component that I believe, um, so uh, sorry, uh, Shahira, I'm not keeping time. Um, just cue me when my time is uh, over, yeah? Um, the other component that I believe that is important for a company uh, is human rights, social and human rights. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, it's not a secret for FGB, we are under a lot of scrutiny on our labor practices, our labor management. Um, we have been uh, accused uh, uh, to practice or to have practices indicative of forced labor in our operation. Uh, we have been uh, under the with, withhold release order by the USCBP, uh, Custom and Border Protection, which means that FGB cannot send our palm oil or palm product to US, into US, and any other, uh, any of our buyers can, can, can cannot also send, you know, uh, our product uh, to to um, US, and that has impact on the supply chain issue, because uh, FGB would need then uh, to be excluded from many of big buyers, um, you know, uh, supply chain, um, and and what we are doing with this, um, you know, um, is uh, working with a number of organizations uh, to improve our labor practices. Um, I must say that, you know, uh, it's not that uh, uh, we do not do anything on improving the labor practices. Um, uh, it, it, it is sometimes, you know, the misconception, misunderstanding as to what is actually being done uh, and what is understood by uh, parties who have been conducting the interviews with the workers. Uh, so that is also a challenge, you know, educating our workers in terms of what are their rights, what are the, the, the conditions of employment. So uh, these are amongst the action that we have taken in FGV. We have ensured that we have a communication deck in uh, a few different languages uh, that we share with our workers uh, so that they understand uh, what they are coming into. So the, the process is we share before they come in into Malaysia, before we do the interview, uh, before they, uh, and, and upon the arrival in Malaysia, we have another session to, to ensure that they truly understand that they're coming uh, to work in a plantation, uh, which could be a remote area. So we have this now outlined as part of our communication pack to potential workers before we interview them in the home country in Indonesia and in India. Uh, and uh, once they have uh, they arrive in Malaysia, again, there will be another round of um, uh, uh, assessing their understanding with regard to um, uh, the employment with FGV. Um, and uh, uh, we have also spent uh, more than 350 million to improve the living condition, the housing facilities uh, for our workers uh, throughout Malaysia. Um, and, uh, you know, we have also improved the terms of condition in the contract of, of employment to take into account and to spell out clearly that, uh, you know, they have the opportunity to leave uh, the, the employment if they want so by giving 30 days notice, one month notice. So in the past, that has been the biggest criticism, you know, one of the biggest criticism that once uh, a, a, a migrant worker is recruited, there's no opportunity for them to leave because the contract do not uh, clearly mention about termination of employment. So that has been uh, addressed. Uh, I believe th this has also been adopted by many other plantation industry, plantation companies. And uh, we have also committed to pay recruitment fee um, for the covering official costs of recruitment. <coughs> so this is another uh, uh, element um, which uh, is heavily scrutinized as a practice indicative of forced labor. Um, you know, the issue around recruitment fee is the big issue because there's a lot of uh, inconsistency with, uh, in the interpretation of recruitment fee. Um, ILO has one definition. Um, of course, uh, if we look at the ILO definition, it's very wide, um, you know, uh, uh, but our, our policy, our government policy has not yet, you know, uh, uh, clarified in uh, certain terms. Uh, what does a recruitment uh, fee cover? Um, uh, and 
uh, the industry standard is that it covers official costs. So the cost, it excludes costs like, you know, passport, uh, passport preparation, uh, and also cost of seeking employment by the migrant workers. Um, so cost of seeking employment before in the home country before uh, they are recruited by any particular company is not covered at this point of time. Uh, so that, that are the biggest uh, key indicators that are being looked and assessed um, as main indicators um, of uh, forced labor. Um, and uh, for FGV, <coughs> you know, um, we are committed to um, support uh, and to ensure that the rights of our workers are respected and protected. Um, uh, with the enhancement of uh, the policy, with the enhancement of the terms of condition of, in the employment, uh, we believe that you know, uh, uh, we are on the right track. Um, uh, to to and uh, to respect uh, the rights of the workers, uh, and we have also installed a, a grievance mechanism, um, a grievance channel for workers uh, to report or to raise alerts um, in of any cases, any issues that they have, uh, which could uh, make us fall into the cracks of you know being accused as practicing forced labor. Uh, and this is also one key component uh, that is important to be strengthened by any company uh, to ensure that you know, workers have trust in grievance uh, channel and they know that when they raise any grievance, any complaints, uh, it is free from fear of reprisal. So they, they know that they will not be reprimanded they will not, there will be no adverse uh, impact, adverse Im effect on the workers um, because of the grievances that they raise. So that, that uh, uh, in, 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 um, in brief uh, of things that we can, um, uh, we ca I can share with you as to what FGV is currently doing. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I think with uh, that, I will, I will also probably uh, just highlight, um, you know, uh, to, uh, just to say that uh, palm oil industry is one of the industry that is heavily regulated. We have RSPO, we have we have MSPO, we have um, you know other uh, uh, extra territorial laws that indirectly apply to us. For example, the Modern Slavery Act of UK, although you know it is not directly applicable to us, um, it is uh, being a supply chain of many big brands uh, that are originated in UK and Europe and other countries. You know we are bound to also be assessed uh, and to ensure compliance uh, uh, and adherence to this extraterritorial law. So similar law is emerging in uh, Australia, in New Zealand. Uh, of course, US, uh, we have uh, felt the impact. Um, and, and we are also seeing you know, greater EU scrutiny um, just recently in July, EU uh, adopted a directive uh, requiring business operation in EU and those who have, you know, supply chain in other parts to ensure that they conduct due diligence on uh, climate action and also human rights practices before they can buy products from the supply chain. So this, uh, although this is still directive, but we suspect, we, we anticipate that this will be a leg legislative requirement by 2023, the latest. So this is something that um, companies like FGV um, uh, is obligated to ensure that our, our in order to ensure the sustainability of our business, we have to ensure that our operation and our practices is in line with the sustainability um, agenda internationally uh, and in compliance with our commitment to NDPE. So I will stop here. Uh, and uh, I believe there will be a que opportunity for questions later. Thank you, Shahira. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the interesting presentation for Hasana. So uh, I just want to highlight like apart from uh, FGV come out with a special division to, uh, in order to um, focus on the sustainability and also come up with a specific policy for the sustainability. Uh, I also attracted to the FGV initiative which um, educating uh, the workers, which I think that is really important for the workers to feel safe and also to feel um, 
to have the trust towards the FGV. So um, overall, based on the presentation by Kohasana just now, we can clearly see that there are actually a lot of efforts have uh, been taken by FGV as one of the plantation payers in Malaysia in order to strengthen ESG practices in the plantation industry. So um, apart from that, I just want to uh, remind all the audience, if you have any question related to the presentation, you can just um, key in the question in the uh, chat box. Um, so now um, let's shift our focus on the action that have been taken in order to address issue relating to the ESG by MPOC as one of the plantation organization in Malaysia. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Ruslan to talk about the initiative that have been taken by MPOC. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ruslan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank MIDF for inviting me to talk at this webinar entitled uh, ESG Palm Oil Industry Myths and Reality. Um, as we all know, we have been enjoying uh, a good palm oil prices for almost one and a half year. And we also know that from the onset of COVID-19, early 2020, the palm oil industry in Malaysia is facing an acute shortage of worker leading to poor crop recovery, poor productivity, especially to companies that are highly dependent on foreign workers. Uh, though pricing is greatly influenced by supply and demand, but there are other factors that may have significant impacts on demand leading to fluctuation of prices, even when the production is optimal. Nowadays, the public are very dependent on what is written on the internet. And this is very important for any businesses to survive. Though the validity of internet posts are questionable, but it does influence customers' perception. And this is what the palm oil industry is facing to a certain extent, very damaging. The Malaysian Palm Oil Council, as the agency responsible to promote palm oil globally, we are responsible to provide the correct information to global customers. I would like to thank uh, Puan Nurul Hassana, who has actually touched some of the policy that has been put in place. Um, if you were to Google, um, let me share my screen first. Okay, can you see the screen? All right, great. You can see the screen. All right. All right. If you were to Google uh, palm oil on the internet, I got to get this correct. Is it moving? No. Huh? I'm not moving. Okay. Let me try again. Um, stop share. Okay, let me put this one. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Why is it not moving? Um, if it is still not moving, maybe or uh, we can um move um ask the IT department to share your slides. Is it okay for you, Dr. Rosan? I'm okay or with that. Okay. Okay, it's moving. Oh, it's now. moving. All right, great. All right. Okay. Um if you were to Google uh oil palm or palm all the internet it is quite common for you to come across messages like this. For some, messages like this will invite the reader to read or to try to, to discover a lot more what is being talked about. But to majority of the uh, internet uh, readers, they will take it at face value. And if you look at this, how did palm oil become such a problem? And what can we do about it? Or how can palm oil become the world's most hated, but yet it is the most used fat source? Okay, or palm oil is unavoidable. Can it be sustainable? There are five problems with sustainable palm oil. Look at FGV, they produce sustainable palm oil and yet it's being denied entry. Look at Samdabi. They are the first, uh, you know, they are the pioneer in terms of sustainable palm oil and yet they were denied entry in the US. So what's the problem here? Okay, um, I think 
we have to go back to the very beginning. Um, the oil palm industry in Malaysia started 100 over years ago. Okay. And we were the first one to talk about sustainability. At that time, the word is not sustainability, but we use things like good agriculture practices, code of practices, and we have put that in place. Okay. We were among the first one in 2000, in 1917, we start to improve our good agriculture practices. And then we developed into uh, the code of practices that was introduced by MTOB in 2007. Then only comes into the picture, the RSPO, the Roundtable Sustainable Palm Oil, right? who tell us, okay, this is what needs to be done. And yet we have been doing that all this while. Then comes, you know, um, a lot of other uh, certificate, uh, certification system. And realizing this uh, shortcoming that, you know, has been imposed by the RSPO, the Malaysian government established what is called as Malaysian sustainability, uh, Malaysian sustainable palm oil. So in this case, um, the Malaysian sustainable palm oil is looking at what are the flaws that are present in RSPO, especially in terms of addressing the issues related to smallholders. Okay, um, then if you look at the international scheme, um, they only comes into the picture in 2004, followed by, you know, and then the ISPO comes into the picture in 2007. And then uh, the, uh, you know, the ISCC came into the picture, then comes into the uh, United Nations SDG goals. So all this comes way after the Malaysian have put the system in place. Okay, we have been talking about sustainable palm oil for more than 70, 80 years, but it was not using the term sustainable, right? And if you look at the, the international scene today, when you talk about sustainable palm oil, it is very Eurocentric, okay? The Euros, the, the EU are the one that are imposing what needs to be done, okay? And yet we are the producers, right? We are the producers, they determine our standard. It should be the other way around. We produce, we should determine the standard, but this is not the case. And uh, if you can see nowadays, there, there's a lot of initiative that was put by the EU to stop the, you know, the, uh, the monopoly by palm oil in the world. Okay, if you look at this particular chart, what is interesting is that if you look at the producers, Malaysia and Indonesia are not among the most powerful nation in the world. If you look at the importers, okay, the biggest importers are India and China. But the one that makes the biggest noise are the European Union and the American. And yet they are not that, you know, they are not buying that much of palm oil from us. But they are very influential. They are very forceful in terms of their policy. They implement things and they, were, they are able to say, look, if you don't follow our policy, we'll encourage people not to buy palm oil. And this is quite, you know, it's quite scary. Because whatever that they impose, whether you like it or not, you have to count down to them, right? Okay, um, realizing these shortcomings, um, the Malaysian government has actually put several policy in place. Uh, we call it as Malaysia Green Deal in 2019, uh, looking at the issue about deforestation. Okay, the Malaysian government has put a moratorium to cap the total planted areas for all pump to be at 6.5 million hectares. Currently, we have about 6.1 million hectares, even though it's reported 5.9. But you know, unofficially, we have got about 6.1, 6.2 million hectares. But it will stop at 6.5 million hectares. And there will be no new planting on peatland areas, which is basically one of the issues that has been mentioned by the European Union time and again, that we are destroying our peatland. And we are also destroying our forest. So there is a ban on conversion of forest reserve for oil palm cultivation. But the issue is not that simple because in Malaysia, land matters is under the jurisdiction of state government. The federal government can put policies, but if the state government decide not to follow the policy, this is where the problems that, you know, that can come uh, about. 
And uh, to make our, our industry very uh, transparent, what we have actually agreed upon is that to make all our oil palm planted areas to be accessible to the public through the internet. So these are the things that has been taken by the government to make, uh, you know, to meet the sustainability criteria that have been uh, posted by the European Union. Okay, where do we stand now? Apart from RSPO, we also have the MSPO, the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil. As of August 2021, we have about 87.7% of our land areas certified sustainable. Okay, and the remainings are basically the smallholders, especially the unorganized smallholders, simply because these are the group of people that lack the finance, that lack the academic background to actually go into certification. But when it comes to organized smallholders like Felda and Felcra scheme, and also the plantation companies, almost all of them has been certified. And from all the 455 mills that we have in Malaysia, 433 are certified. So um, this is where we are trying to show to the world, look, RSPO has put a lot of, you know, principle and criteria to meet what they call as certified palm oil. So does MSPO. And if you were to overlap MSPO and RSPO, you can see that the similarity is almost about 95, 96%. Okay. Um, this is an, uh, another you know, um, important issues that has been mentioned time and again by the, uh, I would say the competitors of palm oil. Um, they always blame that palm oil is the cause of deforestation, okay? And they always blame that you cut down forests to plant palm oil or to plant oil palm, okay? But if you, look, if you were to look at what really happens in the world, okay, this is a study that was done by the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, and they can say that the biggest driver of deforestation is not oil palm. It is actually the beef industry, okay, the beef industry. Oil palm is only using, like what by, was mentioned by Professor Nassel, only 6% of the total agricultural area. Why are we being blamed for this? But the biggest chunk of land areas are being used for um, the cattle industry. And you can see that um, among all the vegetable crops or among all the uh, agriculture's company, the one that is really concerned about you know, saving forests or uh, trying to propagate uh, you know, the conservation of forests is the oil palm industry. Okay, you look at the companies that are very committed to no deforestation. 59% of what has been reported in the world come from the oil palm industry. Look at soybean, look at the forestry, look at the beef industry. So this, these are the industries that, that are not really concerned about deforestation. And yet they are the biggest driver, but we got the blame. Okay, um, if you look at the world agriculture land, there are about 4.9 billion hectares available. And look at how much... Uh, we use for oil palm, okay, 0.31% of the total agriculture land. And of the total 5.25% oil seed, okay, we are only using 0.31%. And yet we are pro providing about 38% of the total oil and fat supplies in the world. Okay, if you look at, you know, um, no deforestation, EU, has been claiming that they are the champion of no deforestation. But the, real, the reality is saying otherwise. Look at this particular report by Fiona Harvey in 2020 that appears in the Guardian. They say that Europe is losing forests to harvesting at an alarming rate. And look at the percentage, where they are. Look at Germany, look at Belgium, France, UK, 12.9% forest. Italy, 31%, and look at Malaysia, 55.3% our land are still under forested area. So, I mean, EU is championing, but we are walking the talk. They are not walking the talk. Okay. And they always blame that the oil palm industry is the main reason why some of our iconic species has been 
you know, it's been uh, dislodged and, and displaced. And one of the biggest uh, iconic species that they like to use is the orangutan. In all the advertisement, they always say that all pump drive away orangutan from their habitat. But look at what we actually does. Okay, in 2006, under the uh, Malaysian Palm Oil Council, we established the Malaysian Palm Oil Wildlife Conservation Fund. Basically, we put aside uh, 10 million ringgit um, to any companies that are interested to work together with us, okay, on, in terms of conservation. And we have been working on, uh, you know, uh, rescuing animals, uh, you know, providing shelters to often uh, animals and, and things like that. And the project becomes bigger and bigger, and it needs more and more money. Okay. Um, under the MPOWCF, we establish what we call as the Wildlife Rescue Unit in Sabah, who are responsible to provide assistance to any wild animal that has been displaced by the industry. Okay, we provide them sanctuary, we rescue trapped animal, we rescue often animals, and we release them back to the, to the wild once we have actually rescued them. Okay, as I said just now, all these projects requires funding. So in 2019, the MPOC with approval from the MPIC establish what we call as the Malaysian Palm Oil Green Conservation Foundation, where every single ton of CPO produced by companies in Malaysia, they will allocate one ringgit to this fund. So normally we produce about 20 million tons. So there's a funding of about 20 million ringgit for uh, the MPOGCF to operate. So what does it do? It actually encourage and support conservation initiative and sustainable practices within the industry. It initiate and support reforestation program of degraded forests. It provide assistance for wildlife and biodiversity research. It also fund conservation activities, including related promotional activities and awareness program. So what it does is actually to actually focus mainly on conservation, right? And we are trying to show to the world, look, we are not just thinking about profitability. We are also looking at conservation. We are also addressing issues related to biodiversity loss. Okay, um, these are some of the projects that was placed under the MPOGCF. One is the planting of 1 million forest tree. What we do is that there are a lot of pockets of forests due to uh, defo uh, deforestation. So what we do is that we link them together. We plant forest species to link this pocket to allow the wild animal to roam from one pocket to another pocket. So this will allow the wild animal like elephant to move around rather than they encroach into plantation, they go through this degraded forest. And we have actually, uh, we actually established a bonian elephant sanctuary where we have set up a research center for us to understand and study the Bonian elephant. Right? We also have a, a program under what is called as human elephant coexistence. What we do is we plant napier grass because napier grass is one of the main um, you know, food that is consumed by elephant. So we encourage the elephant to move around uh, the corridor rather than encroaching the plantation. And one of the latest program that we have is the Malayan Tiger Conservation Program, where we breed a captive tiger to produce offspring. Then we will actually rear this uh, offspring until maturity before we release them to the wild. So these are some of the activities that we do in terms of conservation. So when when you know when organization like Greenpeace claims that we, you know, 25 orangutans are lost every day and things like that. They are just talking about things that happen that may or may not happen. But we are talking about things that we do, right? Things that we do so that this thing will not happen. Say, for example, we conduct the survey, we have the conservation program, and we will also continue to do another survey in, in 2021, trying to establish whether the all palm, uh, whether the um, Orangutan population is really de decreasing or is it you know, uh, improving 
under the the uh, the current situation. So if you look at the um, wildlife um, diversity in all palm plantation, it's a lot more that has been recorded in any all palm plantation compared to any other vegetable oil crops in the world. Okay, so these are the studies that shows that okay in terms of biodiversity we have a lot more fishes we got a lot more reptiles we got a lot more birds mammals and amphibian compared to biodiversity that are present in other oil crops so this shows that what are the things that we are doing then this comes bring us to the one of the most important uh, subject matter they always blame that palm oil is health hazard palm oil is bad in fact, the last uh, two months, I think we have seen a lot of articles coming from India saying that palm oil cause heart disease. But if you were to look into all those articles that has been published, you will never get any uh, references attached to them. These are all, uh, you know, um, just sweeping statements. It is not properly justified. There is no research to support what they claim. So now let us look at what are the research that has been done to negate all these accusations. Okay, first we look at the oil palm uh, with the palm oil composition. All, all palm produces palm oil and it contains a very balanced oil. You talk about polyunsaturated fatty acid, you talk about monounsaturated fatty acid, you talk about saturated fatty acids. Oil palm produces oil that are very balanced. You have got almost equal amount of monounsaturated and saturated fatty acid. Okay, and what does this mean? It means that in terms of health, there's a lot of advantage when it comes to palm oil. Okay. Apart from the oil composition, there are two main components which are present in oil palm or we present in palm oil, which are not present in other oil crops. One is tocotrienol or vitamin E. Another one is beta carotene. Beta carotene is a pro vitamin A. When you, are, when you consume beta carotene, it will be converted into carotenoid. And carotenoids have got a lot of advantages. So, but, but I would say that of late, we have a lot more articles as such. Palm oil has a reputation for being bad for you. But let's look at what the nutritionists talk about. Whether all the claims are correct or is there any, uh, you know, anything that you should know. Okay, if you were to compare um, the contents of the vitamin E or tocotrienol in all the oil crops, all palm produces the most, okay? Palm oil has got the most amount of tocotrienol in its oil compared to other crops. Okay, looks, now we look at the benefit of the tocotrienol. What does it do? Okay, the first one is that it is a powerful antioxidant. It prevents stroke. It inhibits cholesterol synthesis and it kills cancer cells. These are all, uh, you know, claims that has been supported by research. It is not a sweeping statement, but it has been supported by research that has been done locally and internationally. Okay, it's proven. And you look at what it does to the heart. Okay, so it's actually helping the heart to, it helps to provide, uh, to, to give a healthy heart when you consume palm oil. And this is not the case for other oil. And look at what it does to the liver. It's the same thing, okay? It's good to your liver, it's good to your heart, and it's also good for your skin, okay? So it's good for your skin. So you make your skin more, you know, uh, softer and moisture. So there's a lot of good benefits that palm oil has actually contributed. Um, then look at vitamin A. Okay, one of the biggest problem nowadays is we have a vitamin A deficiency among young students. And in Af Africa, there has been studies that 
um, you know, by supplementing biscuits with vitamin A, with beta carotene, you can actually avoid blindness. This is proven not just by our study, but it's also done by studies from elsewhere. So this is what um, is lacking in the, in, on the internet. So a lot of people are putting, you know, uh, sensationalized uh, news on the badness of uh, palm oil. Okay, so we have been trying to, to, to provide information that will provide uh, the advantages of consuming palm. So the benefits of carotene, as I said, is a, is a very good antioxidant. Uh, it has pro, uh, pro vitamin E activity. It actually protects your cardiovascular. It actually stimulates your immune system, especially now during the COVID uh, period. It could be a good way of actually minimizing the impact of COVID by stimulating your immune system and it prevents night blindness. So these are things that you can benefit from palm oil. Uh, recently, we have actually identified what we call as palm phenolic that have the purple color. Okay, um, this is, I mean, you can see a lot of this in mangosteen, for example. And again, this is also a very good antioxidant which is, has got anti-inflammation uh, characteristics. So these are present in palm oil. And um, if you were to look at um, food nowadays is that there's a, a lot of people are talking about trans fat. Okay, trans fat is a health issue. Uh, when you consume oil, when you use oil like uh, the soft oil, like uh, corn, soybean and rapeseed, for them to be used to make, uh, you know, things like margarine, okay, you have to solidify it because of the composition. They have to solidify it through a process called partial hydrogenation. So when you solidify your fat, you produces what is called as trans fat, and trans fat is bad for your health, okay. Trans fat is carcinogenic. But in the case of oil palm, you do not require to solidify your fat because of the composition of the oil that is present in palm oil. So you do not have trans fat in palm oil, but you have trans fat in products derived from soybean, uh, rapeseed, corn oil, and sunflower oil. Okay, um, I would like to show this slide because to me, it is the world hated oil, but yet, I mean, you cannot live without palm oil. Okay, like what was mentioned by Puan Hassan just now, oil palm is a very efficient crop. Okay, it uses only 6.6% .6 land, uh, percent of land area, yet it produces about 38.7% uh, of the oil and fat supply in the world. And if you look at the productivity, you can, you can produce about four metric ton of oil per hectare per year for oil palm. Look at the nearest competitor, rapeseed, is hardly one metric ton per hectare per year. Okay, and because of that, it is a very productive oil. And if you look at the energy balance, the conversion of energy, look at oil palm compared to rapeseed and soybean. Okay, you only put in a small amount of energy, but you yield a huge amount of energy in return. So it's a very efficient crop and it's a very uh, productive crop. Okay, um, as I said just now, um, the oil palm produces oil that comes from two sources. One is from the mesoca or, uh, you know, the flesh, and the other one comes from the kernel and each one of them have got different uses. So they can go through all kinds of uh, processes and look at the users, okay? So the users is endless. And if you were to extract from kernel, you get crude kernel oil and look at the users, okay? And um, this is possible because of the composition of the oil. The palm kernel oil contains a lot of uh, you know, saturate, uh, unsaturated fatty acid. But for the um, miso cup oil or the palm, uh, crude palm oil contains of a lot of 
saturate the palm oil. Okay, these are some of the major application of uh, palm oil. You can see all kind of food. You can you can go to the supermarket. At least seventy five to eighty five percent of the food products on the shelf contains palm oil. Okay, but for non non food application, all palm produces palm oil that can be used for all kind of things. Look at this: toothpaste, shampoos, concrete. You just name it. It can be used for anything. Sky is the limit. It depends on how creative you are. Okay, from anything to everything. Okay. And to conclude, I would say that all this hype about palm oil is simply because we are so successful. And I would say that palm oil is a victim of our own success. Why? Because it's very productive. Uh, very productive. Has a lot of health benefits. It is very versatile in terms of application, and it's the only oil crop among the 17 oil crops in the world that has been certified sustainable. Okay, and all this actually uh, created an environment where we look at this, this uh, you know, billet balls. When the industry first began in 1958 to 1962, look at oil palm. It was at number 10 in terms of consumption of oil, production and consumption. Within less than how many years, 30 years, it became number two. Okay, it displaced rapeseed oil, it displaced sunflower, it was competing with soybean. In 2010, it became number one. Okay, it became number one. And since then, we have been number one in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, usage of farm. And why is it so important? Look at the amount of money is involved. 136.3 billion USD in 2020. And in 2025, it's expected to be 200 billion USD. Of course, when you, you involve a lot of money, there's a lot of animosity among our competitors. Okay, They will find all kinds of uh, ways and means trying to discredit them. And they're very uh, concerted in terms of their effort. But, uh, you know, because oil palm is only produced by two big countries, so we have to face the rest of the world to compete, you know, with all these other crops. So, um, what we are doing here, we are trying to be, uh, to continue to be competitive. Um, at the same time, we would like to be a responsible responsible contributor to the uh, to the food security of the country and in doing so we also would like to comply with internationally acceptable standard for sustainability so we continue to improve yes we cannot deny some of the things that we are happening here in malaysia uh, that actually leads to uh, you know the uh, issues in us for example uh, or the uh, issues in europe but we are, we are improving. So we adopt uh, the international standards and we try to implement that. Um, we are also looking at biodiversity conservation and environment. So we have put things in place. We are not just talking, but we have put things in place. There, there are already results coming out you know, to show to the world that, look, we are responsible producers. And at the same time, MPOC in particular, we are continuously coming up with a lot of information uh, to tell the public what are the applications of palm oil, what are the health benefits of palm oil. Okay, so all the correct information, but unfortunately, uh, so those information are being flooded by information which are more sensationalized. You know, things like you know, palm oil is bad, palm oil causes haste palm oil costs uh, orangutan, you know, to die and all those kind of things. But um, all in all, um, I would say that palm oil has been getting a lot of bashing from the importers. Um, but it is quite sad to say that palm oil is the only oil that has got this bashing. Even though we are the only oil that has been certified sustainable, I mean, we don't see the same problems with soybean. We don't see the same problem with, with corn oil. We don't see the same problem with rapeseed. 
but all palm that produces palm oil remains the focus. So with that, thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roslan, for the very interesting presentation. So I'll, I am really I agree with you or in the parts where um, palm oil have been um, have offered a lot of benefit and there's so much um, initiative um, have been taken by MPOC since 19 and 1917, but still um, we are the one who always get the blame despite that we are not the main driver of the deforestation uh, activities. And also I was really interested with uh, your um, statement just now, uh, palm oil victims, it's its own success. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So um, right now, uh, with the end of presentation from um, Nur Hassana and Dr. Ruslan, we will move to our next agenda, which is um, uh, the panel session. So during this session, I will ask a quick question to our panel. So um, let, uh, I will start with the first question. So my first question will be for Nur Hassana. So just now you mentioned about the renewable initiative, right? Which is uh, quite new for FGV. So uh, could you share with us what are the challenges that uh, you have faced um, in regards to the, to the new, um, new renewable uh, initiative? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I think the uh, renewable energy initiative uh, in FGV, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it started much earlier. We have uh, now 28 uh, biogas facilities uh, in our mills. Uh, and uh, the, some of the challenges um, uh, I foresee would be, you know, in, in, in the current context of uh, limited uh, incentive for companies, um, you know, to, to promote uh, the installation of biogas facilities. Um, we heard yesterday through RMK12, you know, uh, the government announced there are some, some positive announcement with regard to support for companies or corporates uh, moving towards uh, 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 climate initiative agenda uh, where incentive tax uh, innovation will be introduced. I think that would be most welcome, uh, which we found, we have found to be a challenge for us in the past, you know, the cost of renewable energy, although it, it, <coughs> it, it is, it will benefit the environment, but uh, the cost uh, in installation of uh, facilities, methane capture and all that uh, is still there. But we still do that for, for FGV. Uh, because it's not only part of the legal requirement uh, to ensure environmental protection, but uh, also part of our belief and in the values that, that we need to do the right thing uh, uh, to ensure that we uh, uh, do business responsibly. Uh, but with the announcement yes, uh, two days ago on RMK 12, um, I, I believe there will be exciting uh, initiative, new initiative that uh, will uh, enable more companies uh, to join the bandwagon to support this uh, climate agenda. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for your explanation, uh, Panora Sana. Um, that's a re um, really excellent point. Um, and then um, my next question will be for Dr. Roslan. So this question it will be something related to the perception on the plantation industry from the Western countries. So in regards to the negative publicity from the Western countries, especially in terms of the labor practices, do you think this issue is more of a miscommunication? Oh, well, um, well, uh, in 2000 and 17, 18, the uh, Malaysian government actually conducted uh, a thorough survey uh, on the labor practices and also child labor. Um, this, that was a work done by uh, the ministry and also by ILO, uh, ILO in, in US. And um, it was actually implemented by DOSEL, Department of uh, Statistics Malaysia. Um, we came up with a report um, and the report says that the percentage of forced labor is very small, very minimal. And um, the report was presented to the uh, government uh, to be endorsed. Uh, unfortunately, um, the report was not accepted by the ILO USA uh, simply because uh, they feel that um, the study should be done by an independent body. Uh, because the study was done by the uh, ministry, 
so they feel that there are some you know kind of uh, manipulation there um, so this is this is an issue you see um, they have got their representative in the project and yet they do not believe what their representative is saying so um, i think um, all this while in the oil palm industry uh, this is one of our biggest challenge trying to get the acceptance of the advanced countries on whatever that we do. For example, if you talk about Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil, uh, they, will, they always consider MSPO as second, uh, second class compared to RSPO because MSPO was established in Malaysia. RSPO was established by a group of foreign companies. So um, this is actually a big challenge. And um, in fact, uh, we are in our discussion with ILO. They wanted to repeat the same program again sometime uh, this year and next year. Hopefully, uh, they will give a, a better you know, uh, findings and uh, will get a better acceptance by ILO. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ruslan. Thanks so much for a very clear explanation. So uh, my next question would be for, uh, for Nur Hassana. So um, in regards to the um, US VB ban, right? So I would like to ask uh, for Nur Hassana, how do FDB respond to this kind of allegation? I mean, what are the steps, steps taken in order to clear the air? Yeah, All right. Thank you. So with regard to the US CBP uh, ban, um, when the uh, order came out September last year, it came as a surprise to us, uh, simply because we have been communicating since um, 2019 on the initiative uh, undertaken by FGV uh, to enhance <coughs> our labor practices in FGV, um, uh, uh, to, including you know, our affiliation with Fair Labor Association, uh, a non-profit organization uh, where we have a long-term engagement. Um, we, we had been working with them since end 2019 and until now, uh, 2021, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, come up with they have come up with a couple of reports on MTV's initiative and operation towards enhancement of um, you know our labor practices. Uh, but the but the uh, WRO the order came out uh, last year September last year, and uh, uh, we we note that uh, when we have a session with the uh, CBP the Customs and Borders Protection of uh, the US agency, um, <clears throat> what they mentioned is that they re when they receive the petition on the allegation uh, highlighted in the petition, uh, they do their research um, or, or they, they say it investigation by research and they don't need a, a full-fledged evidence uh, to issue the WRO. Uh, what they need to establish is reasonable suspicion. Um, so we know that um, it will be uh, um, and we cannot challenge um, the, the way they conduct the investigation because that is prescribed by the procedures and regulations under CBP. Um, uh, but what they say to us is that um, once DWRO has been issued, um, it's the duty of the company um, to work towards the modification and revocation of the um, WRO by producing a, an independent audit report uh, that uh, confirm uh, non-presence of the 11 indicators of forced labor in our operation. Um, and of course, uh, in our talks with CBP, they did not disclose um, uh, the, the investigation, the nature of their findings um, with regard to the 11 indicators of forced labor. They, they, they did not disclose the nature, they did not disclose the location, um, uh, suffice to say that they have reasonable suspicion that the uh, indicators presence in our operation. So on part of FGV, well, what we are currently doing now is uh, a point, uh, we, we have a point of, we, we in the final lack of appointing the auditor, which uh, will start doing audit work um, starting October, November, uh, towards you know, producing a report um, uh, that we will use to petition for the revocation of the WRO. Uh, what we need to demonstrate in the report is that FGV has taken all the necessary initiative, um, uh, and this has been verified by the, uh, this need to be verified by the auditor to close gaps uh, against all the 11 indicators of forced labor. 
So that is what FGV is currently doing. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Pano Hasana. So for uh, our final session, um, another question for Dr. Ruslan, it's in terms of the sustainability policy. So in terms of sustainability policy and efforts, have been taken by the organization and plantation players in uh, plantation industry. Do you think we are at the satisfying, le satisfying level? I mean, what are the core aspects that we should focus on in order to strengthen the ESG practices in the plantation industry? Okay, um, as I said just now, um, um, several Malaysian companies are the pioneers in the uh, roundtable sustainable farm model. Okay, companies like Katri, I mean, Samdabi, uh, you know, at the time they had Golden Hope, Gatri, uh, IOI, KLK. So they were the pioneers in, in the, uh, in the R RSPO. Um, then when the Malaysian government uh, decided to establish the MSPO, um, I think as far as the big plantation companies, there, was, there are no issues. Okay, there are no issues. Uh, they, they are basically certified both using RSPO and uh, MSPO. On top of that, there are some companies that are also certified under the ICC, especially those companies that are exporting uh, palm oil for the use of uh, as biodiesel. Right. Um, and again, for the organized smallholders, I think uh, the success is not yet 100%. Uh, there are some hiccups here and there, um, you know, um, but hopefully we should be able to achieve 100% of the uh, MSCO certification. Um, but our biggest challenge is actually among the un unorganized smallholders. These are the, the smallholders have got, say, probably two hectares of land, okay, because to them, uh, first of all, they do not have the knowledge. Second, they do not have the finance. Third, they don't see the direct impact of sustainability, okay. Uh, to them, if you want to be certified, what would be their, you know, benefits there and then? Will their palm oil be, uh, you know, sold at a higher uh, price? Will they get the benefits, uh, you know, a, a fatter pocket uh, or, or whatever? So these are the things that uh, the Malaysian government is trying to, uh, you know, to identify and uh, to solve the problem. And um, for the Unorganized uh, smallholders, it is under the jurisdiction of Mission Palm Oil Board, where they have got a division uh, looking at certification among the small, uh, unorganized smallholders. And on top of that, the government also put aside, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 50 million ringgit to assist smallholders in particular to get themselves certified. So there's a lot of initiative taken by the government. Of course, uh, it takes time because we have got 6.5 million hectares of land that are planted with palm oil, uh, with oil palm, and 28% of those are owned by the smallholders. It is not a small amount of area, so it takes time for us to, you know, uh, to get it done. Uh, RSPO was there since 2004, so they have got many, many years ahead of us. Uh, MSPO only, was only initiated in 2013. So we only had about eight years, um, you know, so for us to catch up. But even that, we have been doing quite good. Um, you look at the percentage just now that I showed you. It's quite encouraging. And, and also, uh, the MSPO is undergoing a revision of principle and criteria. This is always the case for any certificate scheme. Every five years, they will revise to improve whatever that has been, you know, uh, a problem uh, earlier on. So that's what I can say for the time being. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosan. Thank you so much uh, for the explanation. So um, I think, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosan, uh, uh, and right now we are going to begin uh, to begin answering the questions submitted during the webinars today. So um, as we can see, this topic is really interesting because uh, we can see like uh, there are quite a number of questions from the audience. So as a rem reminder, um, the audience can still submit questions through the question panels in your attendees control panel. So um, the first question uh, from the from the audience it's um, in regards to the in regards to the uh, work sorry in regards to the uh, work labor shortage. So um, currently 
uh, Mark, Mark Ma uh, on Tuesday appealed to the government to allow foreign workers to enter the country to make growing demand this and next year. So citing a critical shortage of 35,000 workers since 2019. So cur uh, currently, how many shortage workers for the farm all site? And what is the impact of the foreign workers ban till year end for the farm all sector? Um, maybe Dr. Ruslan can um, uh, expand. Uh, what's your, what's your, your thought on this uh, question? Um, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. So the question uh, is how many shortage workers for the farm oil sector? And what is the impact okay. of foreign workers ban till year end for the farm oil sector? Okay, um, I think the, the latest count was something like 75,000 uh, workers. Uh, we, had, we had several meetings uh, organized by, the, by different minister, uh, ministry, KLN, uh, MOH, uh, you know, and uh, Human Resource Ministry. So uh, trying to address this. Uh, as you know, um, we, the, the oil palm industry is very labor dependent. Uh, especially in terms of uh, the harvesting. So and to date, we still have got no machinery that can assist us in terms of harvesting. Mm -hmm. So it's being done by, man, uh, it has to be done manually. Um, a lot of our workers in terms of uh, shortages are the, uh, the, the harvesters, okay? And this requires some skill because if you do not have skilled workers, uh, the harvesters will be harvesting unripe fruits. So when you harvest unripe fruits, you're talking about losses, right? So um, currently, as I said just now, there are about 75,000 shortage in terms of uh, foreign workers. And um, there has been initiative by various companies and also by the government to actually allow the entry of foreign workers. So uh, Felda, for example, uh, is quite active in trying to discuss what needs to be done Okay, to allow the foreign workers to come in under the current situation. So uh, Felda have gone a, a step ahead, uh, for example, trying to go and provide services in the origin country. Okay, uh, sorry, I mean, for example, a lot of the harvesters come from Indonesia. Felda is offering to go to Indonesia to set up a center that they can actually provide vaccination to potential workers uh, to be brought to Malaysia. So once they come over to Malaysia, then they will undergo the normal uh, SOP that is being imposed by the MOH, KLN and, and whatnot. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that there are initiatives taken by various country, uh, by various companies and ministry trying to ease off the shortage of labor. And this is very urgent. If you don't solve this problem, um, as what has been reported by uh, the newspaper sometime, I think about two months ago, uh, we are going to lose about 2 billion ringgit just by virtue of not having the workers. Because whether we have workers or not, the oil palm trees will continue to produce crops. Whether they're harvested or not, new crops will come in and the crops will rot in the tree. And if you were not to harvest the crops, we are just losing money. So all the efforts to, you know, to come up with good, healthy crops, that you fertilize them, you take care of them. But if you don't harvest a crop, you're not going to get any products. So we are not going to achieve 20 million metric ton of CPO for this year, simply because we do not have the workers. So um, my, my, my urge is that hopefully the initiative taken by companies like Felda and, all, and also Saim Dhabi will materialize in the near future. Okay, uh, but I don't know. I mean, with the change of government every now and then, so uh, policy might change. So we don't know, we don't know what's gonna happen. But as far as the industry is concerned, we are really in dire need of foreign workers so that we can keep up with our productivity. All right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ruslan. Uh, we hope that this um, labor shortage issue issue can be resolved um in can be um resolved in the coming, in the near term, so that we can get uh, the um highest productivity for the palm oil industry. And then my next question would be for uh, Pandora Hasana. 
So the question would be, um, you did mention about FGB do not cover the cost of passport and cost of seeking employment. But this is where the, con the contention is when such expensive costs are not covered by big plantation companies. As companies, uh, migrant workers are forced to sell property, borrow money from lender with excessive uh, interest. Will there be a cost in consideration in the future? Yep. Uh, thank you. This is again a very critical question. Um, it, it, this goes back to the definition of uh, recruitment fee. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, an aspect that um, the plantation and the industry players um, are thinking. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, it will not be uh, a unilateral decision, you know, because uh, we need to also um, look at from the industry perspective. But allow me to also mention, make a mention uh, that, uh, you know, uh, with regard to this, this official cost, it's not only adopted by the plantation company, but uh, at, uh, other companies in the uh, other sectors, construction sectors, you know, uh, in uh, other industrial sectors, um, also adopt uh, this uh, uh, recruit, definition of recruitment fee, recru cost of recruitment. Uh, to refer to official cost. Um, it, uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, something that has been regarded as uh, in being incons inconsistent with the definition uh, under the ILO um, def uh, concept. Um, and uh, I will be speculative if I were to commit to anything right now, um, uh, but uh, uh, safe, I, I can safely say, however, that uh, you know, we are looking um, at how to manage this expectation um, on recruitment cost. <coughs> um, uh, bearing in mind that we also have a duty to, to also ensure that uh, clear commitment uh, to our other external stakeholders. So um, I will not um, man make any mention at this point of time uh, uh, for that reason. But uh, this is an international uh, interesting discourse that is happening um, in the industry uh, and also amongst uh, you know, uh, the uh, other sectors as well on what would be uh, the rightful and acceptable uh, definition on component of recruitment fee. Um, so I will stop there and I apologize that uh, if the answer is unsatisfactory, uh, but uh, that is my caveat. Thank you, Shahira. Thank you so much, Verna Harsana. All right, uh, moving on to the next question because we have quite a lot of a number, quite a lot of questions. So the next question will be for Dr. Ruslan. So, how does shift by government towards carbon neutral goal impact palm oil output structurally, and should we expect more legislation like the land usage limit law? Okay. Um, well, this is something that that we have been talking. Uh, for many years now. Um, well, I would say that is the way forward, but um, um, but it, it requires a lot of commitment from the various uh, stakeholders. Um, we had we had a meeting with the hydrogen group uh, sometime last week. Um, the problem with Malaysia is that um, we have got a lot of um, roadmaps right, uh, policy, plans. Um, but when it comes to the implementation, it's quite sad to say that some of the roadmaps remain as a roadmap, okay? And I hope that, uh, you know, this initiative that we have been talking about carbon neutral will not be one of those many, many roadmaps that we have been talking about. Um, I think it's about time that we have to walk the talk. Um, you know, there's no point of saying that, okay, we're gonna have this by this, you know, by this year, we have this by that year. But if you don't uh, encourage the various stakeholders to participate, um, I don't think it's going to work. For example, um, you look you look at the uh, renewable energy, you know, for Malaysia. Uh, look at the uh, you know, um, for example, in the oil palm industry, you talk about uh, capture of methane from the palm oil mill, 
there was a, a, a ruling in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, that all palm oil can, uh, meal should have methane capture facilities. Then, yes, it is being followed, but what happened to the methane that they captured? Are they going to use it to produce a high, higher value product or are they going to just uh, flame it? So there are some companies that just they capture the methane and they flame it. That is not going to serve anything. What you should do is that the technology is available. Okay, it's, it's considered a shelf technology. You can just pick from the shelf, you can implement it. So you can convert methane to hydrogen, you can methane, you convert hydrogen to CO2, you know, that's, and you can, you, you can produce a lot of things. But in Malaysia, I'm sorry to say this, the, the, the industry is very dependent on the government uh, funding. Okay, um, big, big companies, I'm sorry to say, sometimes the big companies are the culprit. They are not willing to invest. They are not willing to invest. I used to work for Sam Dhabi, I used to work for Gatri. I had the same experience when I was working with them. Okay, they are not willing to invest. They can talk about all the all the you know the potentials and whatnot, all the roadmaps and you know all the the jargon. But when it comes to implementation, we are still lagging way behind. And I was I'm I'm very confident to say that if you are not careful, we are not just losing in terms of the production volume to Indonesia. We will also lose the the technology lead that we are enjoying now to Indonesia in a very you know, short period of time. So again, as I said, there must be a proper initiative from the policymakers to encourage active and serious participation from the stakeholders. The time for subsidy is, you know, is no longer there. Okay, I mean, I, I just want to quote uh, an example. Uh, we had an issue of uh, food contaminants in palm oil, okay? Um, because uh, the presence of 3-MCPD, which is actually a process contaminant, which is present in palm oil, um, is, is becoming an issue to the European Union, especially. And um, they put, a, they put a, a minimum standard and the, the producers have to comply. But instead of, you know, investing on trying to solve the problems themselves, but the big companies are relying on a grant from the government to solve the problem. Okay, but if they were to solve the problem, whatever that they sell will go to their own pocket. It will not go to the government. Why can't they just spend their money you know, to actually solve this problem? And this is not one, one, one off uh, example. There's so many other examples. I've been in the industry for the past 35 years. I've gone through uh, you know, different types of uh, change in terms of the policy, but I would say that I think it's about time the industry in Malaysia have to be brave enough to step forward, to participate in whatever in the potential that there is. If you're just gonna wait for somebody to come you know, along and have a breakthrough, I think that this is not the time for us to do that. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Roslan. We hope uh, this kind of webinar can also raise the awareness uh, among the uh, big companies so that they can uh, are motivate to, motivated to um, invest and also um, and also uh, implementation can uh, can be can be done and uh, st steps. Uh, I mean, the steps we can take of um, a specific um, initiative in order to solve this kind of problem. And then uh, the next uh, question will be for uh, Puan Rahasana. So uh, it is related to the sustainability as well. So FGP focus on two main issues to cater for sustainability, which are climate climate and human rights focuses, focusing on workers. As ESG agenda also included social and community development. Is there any initiative captured by FGP for this area? Yeah, so yeah. For the, um, thank you for the question. Uh, and and um, let me, uh, you know, uh, uh, just share 
that uh, the two areas that I shared during or at this uh, session is uh, mainly uh, two of many others. It's not just two um, aspects that we're working on. So the climate, uh, I believe it is important for me to highlight these two most uh, material uh, aspect or issues that are faced by MGV and also farm industry as a whole. But we also have programs, initiative uh, on other aspects relating to community. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, you know, on children issue, um, we have uh, uh, established schools um, in Sabah for the children of our um, uh, migrant workers in Sabah uh, who are not able to enroll into public school. So we have, uh, we have 11 uh, community learning centers in, in Sabah uh, for children um, of uh, other nationalities uh, and uh, we partner with uh, the US, uh, you, sorry, the Indonesian embassy um, uh, for, for this, uh, the education of the children. Um, we also have <coughs> um, uh, support for the community around uh, MGV's operation. For example, you know, um, MGV operates in areas where there are indigenous communities, uh, there are orang asli settlement, um, and uh, uh, some of them have been uh, uh, recruited as part of our, you know, um, workforce, um, and, and we see that as uh, you know supporting and contributing back uh, to the society. And um, of course, uh, we also have programs where we open uh, business opportunities uh, for the community living uh, around our estates, um, uh, and uh, to run a sundry shop, you know, uh, to to help us um, with uh, uh, the. Uh, contract on transportation of FFB. So these are small entrepreneurs uh, 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 among the community where we operate in. So there are opportunities, but one of the aspects that we emphasize on if uh, you are going to uh, come into business with FGV or to be part of our supply chain is uh, the need to ensure that you also comply um, with our sustainability agenda. Um, and, and increasingly, uh, we are seeing that, you know, uh, our, the action of our suppliers, our supply chain will also uh, reflect on FGV performance with regard to ESG. So any um, challenges, any gaps um, by our contractors, by our um, suppliers, our supply chain, uh, those operating within our operation uh, could reflect badly on FGV and could um, in turn uh, impact um, our credibility from ESG perspective. So that is uh, you know, some of the aspect <laughs> that uh, we have been working on. And with regard to community, when we operate around um, a, a community, a, a, our operation is also guided by free prior and informed consent. Um, you, you know, some, some uh, uh, activities, some initiative will involve the community. And I, I also uh, realized that, you know, in operation where uh, indigenous settle settlements exist, um, uh, it is important to engage them and to ensure that they understand uh, in terms of uh, how we manage the ladang, the estates. Um, and there could be situation of over, uh, overlapping claim of uh, native customary land rights. And that is also an aspect of uh, how uh, FGV would need to manage. <coughs> we have, um, we have uh, you know, uh, that concern as well in our operation in, some, uh, in Sarawak, uh, mainly. Um, and uh, it, it is, it is uh, an, uh, a practice that we need to embed in our operation that you cannot just impose operation or impose um, things on community or surrounding your operation. You know, uh, engagement, consultation is necessary. So that are some of um, the other aspects that we are working on. Um, on climate action, it's not just, uh, you know, what I have mentioned. We also have our uh, other environmental program that uh, we support. Uh, uh, we have a uh, 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 Sunbear initiative, protection of Sunbear uh, as part of our uh, main uh, conservation initiative for FGB, working together with Pahilitan, working together with MNS and UKM, 
And uh, so far, uh, we have been working together for almost six years and no safe, no less than 60 sun bear within the period of six years. And uh, we have released, I think, half, half of the population into the wild. Um, and we have, um, you know, cola, uh, the cola, put them a uh, uh, cola to, to detect their movement uh, and to ensure that, you know, uh, they do not come back near uh, the uh, human area. So these are uh, other initiatives that uh, FGB had also uh, uh, put uh, emphasis on for our sustainability agenda. Uh, I, I would like to invite all participants to also consult our website and our report, sustainability reporting, uh, which uh, provide further details in terms of uh, what we are currently doing uh, in this front, not limiting to what I have mentioned uh, due to the time constraint, you know, it's, it's impossible to share everything. But yeah, I'm happy to, um, you know, uh, provide more sharing on specific aspect of the ESG if um, there are uh, requests um, from any uh, participants at a later stage. All right, uh, thank you so much for your Hasana. So due to time constraint, maybe we can have another um, one question for Dr. Ruslan and another one question for Pandu Hasana. So uh, maybe the last question for Dr. Ruslan uh, would be, do you think the ESG concerns will impact the CPO prices in the near Medium, medium terms. And the second one is, do you foresee the several MA, uh, MNA activities in plantation sector in Malaysia as one of the ways to moderate the impact of ESG concerns? Well, I think um, as we all know, um, prices is very dependent on supply and demand, right? Um, the ESG will, well, will give some information to the uh, to the listeners, but whether it's going to influence the price or not, I would say that it's going to be very minimal. The impact is going to be very minimal. Um, because as we all know, uh, pricing is not dictated by us. It's actually dictated by the demands in the world. Um, and as, as it is now, um, it's not just dependent on the uh, supply and demand, but there are also uh, factors that you have to factor in, uh, for example, you know, the, the storage in uh, importing countries like India and China. So it depends on whether they have got a lot of storage in terms of soybean, whether they're going to process the soybean or not, when they're going to process it. So this, these are the things that may influence the price. Uh, yes, the ESG uh, can help to improve the understanding, uh, but for a direct impact, I would say that it's going to be quite minimal. Right. Um, the second question is uh, on MEA, right? Okay. <laughs> mm, quite difficult for you to answer that. Probably Puan Hasanah can, can help me on that. Uh... Uh, I think maybe I can uh, pass the uh, second question, uh, which is also the last question for today for to Puan Nur Hasanah. So do you foresee the several MNA activities in plantation sector in Malaysia as one of the ways to moderate uh, the impact of ESG concerns? Hmm. <laughs> well, as Dr. Ruslan mentioned, um, it could, uh, well, I, I think what, what is important uh, to mitigate the impact of ESG in palm industry is to look at, um, you know, uh, for companies like FGV, um, at the end of the day, uh, we want to ensure that um, uh, our product is marketable, you know, yeah. internationally and uh, and also accepted. Um, and on that basis, uh, requirement market requirement is uh, a, a, an import, in a important compass for us. So, what does the market require? And whether FGV uh, or companies like FGV can comply with the market requirement. Uh, one thing that I believe um, is increasingly would be uh, a challenge that FGV in particular would need to address is uh, with regard to um, ensuring our supply chain also, you know, follow uh, the practice of ESG. Um, uh, 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 just to, to contrast, you know, uh, for FGV, we have um, a big 
uh, group of uh, supply chain uh, because many settlers, Felda settlers, uh, uh, many smallholders are part of our supply chain. Uh, in comparison to other companies, farm, farm industry company, <coughs> so that uh, their practices, uh, it would be easier for other companies um, to, to manage the ESG risks and challenges. But for uh, FGV, um, while we are able to um, uh, manage and uh, ensure compliance uh, to ESG requirement, market, re market requirement, uh, regulatory requirement within our own operation, you know, there is also expectation that we manage and ensure our supply chain is also coming along with FGV to comply and be consistent with the ESG requirement internationally. So that would be a challenge for, uh, I'm talking from FGV perspective, uh, but this is something that we must do because uh, I see that, you know, um, in order to support the industry and smallholders, um, there is uh, a need for us to run uh, and work towards um, complying with the demand. And uh, Dr. Ruslan talked about the MSPO standard, um, which uh, as he mentioned, you know, is being revised many times, uh, uh, currently being revised. And it, it is uh, in the right direction to also reflect what market require uh, at the present time. So I would say that, um, uh, you know, this is a journey that all companies would need to embrace. And it's not a one day or two day journey, you know, it's a long journey. Uh, and for FGV uh, in particular, uh, because of our uh, size of our supply chain, uh, this journey <coughs> would uh, maybe uh, be uh, more challenging compared to other players. Uh, but this is something that uh, we are committed to. Uh, we, are, we, we are looking at how we can also support the smallholders in ensuring that their product, their um, uh, 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 FFB, um, which is transformed into oil in our operation, you know, uh, is marketable. Uh, and they would also benefit uh, from the compliance to ESG. Uh, be it in terms of financial or in terms of you know other means uh, that will uh, support smallholders. So I hope I, I, I answered the question and I'll stop here, Shahira. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Mara Saina. Um, I'm so sorry, uh, but maybe we can, um, I have a very last question, very short question. This is a, uh, quite an interesting question. Uh, can um, POC and FGV uh, share with us the wish list for budget 2020 for palm oil industry. Maybe we uh, can start with Dr. Ruslan. <laughs> um, I would say that, okay. Um, the industry brings about uh, 73 billion ringgit to the country. So it's in about uh, 65 to 70 billion ringgit to the, to the, to the country in terms of revenue. Um, if you were to look at any other commodities or any other products in other part of the world, okay, uh, the amount of money that is going to be allocated uh, to the industry should commensurate with the revenue. Um, I think since uh, the industry began, uh, this is not being done. Uh, the budget that has been allocated for all palm is much, much less compared to the revenue that it get generate. So uh, we really hope to see uh, an improvement in terms of the budget allocation for the all palm industry. Um, I mean, for example, we can't move forward without any proper, uh, you know, uh, R&D, without any proper marketing and things like that. And uh, all these require money, right? For example, uh, we are the best, we have got the best R&D Institute in the world when it comes to oil pump and it requires money. But when you look at the amount of money that has been allocated for the R&D in oil pump, it's very small, okay? We are, we are promoting, uh, you know, something like uh, 20 million metric tons of palm oil every year. 
um, that brings in about 70 billion ringgit of revenue every year. But we look at the amount of money that we use to promote. It's very small. It's not even what, 5%? It's not, about, it's not even 1% of the revenue. So does that do justice to, you know, to what we are doing? Um, so to say the least is that there should be more allocation being given to the industry and uh, we shouldn't be thinking about moving to another industry. You can never find an industry that is able to bring in 70, 60 to 70 billion ringgit every year, year in, year out. So don't talk about you know, investing, investing into other crops like durian, la, you know, uh, bamboo, la, for example. You can never find an industry as lucrative as the oil palm industry. And um, we are just dealing with commodity. Uh, we should look into downstreaming where the real money is. Okay, you look at the Fortune 500 countries uh, companies in the world. A lot of them are actually depending on the component that are derived from the oil palm industry. Why are they doing it? Why can't we do it? Okay, but for us to be able to do that, it requires funding. And for us to have funding, yes, there should be some improvement in terms of the budget allocation. All right. Thank that, you so that's my take. Thank you so much, Roslyn. Uh, that's a very uh, on-point explanation. Uh, and as for uh, Pohasana, as for SGB, what uh, are the wish lists for the budget 2020? Well, I, I believe Dr. Roslyn summed it up nicely. You know. All right. Whatever right. uh, the industry need is the, the need of the FGV as well. So whatever he has mentioned, uh, is uh, consistent with uh, you know the call by our company as well. All right, All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shai and Panora Saina. I think we already covered almost uh, all the questions from the audience, and we already come to the end of our webinar session today. Uh, and once again, thank you so much, Dr. Roslan and Puan Harsana, and thank you so much, everyone, for attending to this webinar, uh, ESG and Palm Oil Industry Between Myth and Reality. Uh, before we end this webinar today, I would like to highlight that our local plantation players are taking um, this matter very seriously with good participation. Hence, uh, we hope this webinar can help to clear the air and spread the awareness among the investor as well as the public uh, that, uh, that ESG issue should not be the main factor to discount on the plantation stocks. And it is unfair, unfair to take a, a simplistic view on the plantation sector. So on behalf of MIDF and our presenters, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great day ahead and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.